everyone. Welcome. My name is Paige, and we are here as part of the Shoots Public Library's virtual programming. Uh, before we begin, we're used to this, you know, put your stuff in the chat, make sure you know who you're talking to, etc., etc. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Cooper. He is the Central Oregon Writers Guild president, and he's going to show us a little bit about what is coming up and new and exciting in Central Oregon. Uh, but before that, some things that are new and exciting and coming up for the library. As you know, all of October virtual programming, sorry, all of October programming is entirely virtual, but come November, we do have a chance to bring a couple of events back in person. They are all limited space, so you do have to register in advance. So we will be maintaining the Central Oregon Writers Guild virtual for the November meeting. But we do have returning to the Downtown Bend Library and the Redmond Library quiet writing time. So this is every Monday and Tuesday at the Downtown Bend Library on Mondays and at the Redmond Library on Tuesdays. You have a chance to come in, sit down, share some quiet space with your fellow writers. We do require masks at all of our programs and we are unable to host food and drink. So get your coffee before you get there and then we'll see you in the room for some camaraderie and some co-working. We also have the opportunity to bring back our great collaboration with The Source Weekly for their annual poetry contest. The annual poetry contest is now open. It only remains open for a little bit of time and October 26th is the last day to send your submissions in. All those details are available at shootslibrary.org or you can go to The Source Weekly and find everything you need. We will be hosting the source and all of the winners, as well as some OSU MFA Cascades faculty who are our judges. We'll be hosting them in a live reading in November. And again, details are at deschutzlibrary.org. So send in your poems, all you intrepid Central Oregon writers, and we'll look forward to seeing you at that event, hopefully as the winners. And if not, just come and we'd love to see you in the audience. Okay, I'm going to give it over to Mike. He's going to get us started on tonight's meeting. Thank you, Paige, and thank you for um, hosting us on this. When you said virtual programming, I thought you said spiritual programming, which is kind of, I'm, I guess I'm good either way. Um, <clears throat> can you put a link to the um, poetry contest? And what is the date of the reading in November? I didn't have that for our, um, for the events. Yes, that's a great question. Uh, we are hosting on Saturday, November 20th at 2 p.m. The Source Weekly Reading is Saturday, November 20th. And space is not limited because it is a virtual program and we will be recording in case you already have plans. But you, we hope that you'll see you there and I'll put all those details in the chat. Cool, thanks. <clears throat> um, so I'm gonna do a quick screen share of our website. Uh, like I always do. And here is uh, the, the landing page for the Central Oregon Writers Guild website, uh, meetings and events. Here's um, tonight's program with Alan Santacero, which I'm super excited about. Over on this side, um, the quiet writing. And again, as Paige pointed out, that's gonna start in November. They're still doing Zoom, um, shut up and write. We have cool stuff coming up. Uh, here's today's event. And um, COCC is doing, if, if you absolutely love Moby Dick, um, this would be a really fun thing for you to do. Um, I, th I think you have to sign up for it like right now. I think it's happening right now. Um, Ellen may talk about this, but I'm gonna talk about it too. Ellen, Irene, and I are doing a 10 month writing program that we're going to uh, start in January of next year. And we're taking applications for that. And you can click on that and see, we're calling it The Forge. <clears throat> and it's basically, um, we're, we're providing you uh, what you would get in an MFA program without the cost, and but also without the degree. So um, if you're just interested in, in, in the writing side of it and not looking to get a career in uh, academia, take a look at it. Uh, like I said, we're taking applications. I think we're gonna take 12 people. So applications we're gonna take now through the end of the year and then we'll uh, communicate with everyone. 
Um, a couple of readings, I think uh, Roundabout Books, I think is doing live stuff, but double check that. Um, Ellen's starting a short memoir class tomorrow and she'll let you know if she's got room in that one. Uh, more um, uh, readings, Irene's doing a poetry workshop. I've got a workshop at COCC called Should I Outline? Um, Tamara is doing uh, Introduction to Self-Publishing Platforms. Kristen's doing a Generative Writing Workshop. Um, Ellen's doing another short memoir writing class there. Some more author meetings. We've got Sarah Sear next, uh, next month. Uh, she's going to talk about writing as a visual art. Um, let's see. Authors, authors, blank pages, salon, another class from Irene. Um, oops, sorry, I did that already. Um, authors, authors, Irene and I are doing a food writing class, and theoretically that's in person at COCC at this point. Um, Kristen's doing uh, in person up at Redmond. Don Strogel's doing a marketing class for writers, more roundabout writing salons, and then a couple of things for December here too. Uh, if you know of anything that's not on here, uh, I know that things are coming up. Let me know. Email me at Central Oregon Writers Guild uh, at gmail.com and I'll put those on there. This is going to be great. I'm trying to pin down the date for that and it will probably be that same day as that reading, but in the morning. So um, it'll probably be like nine to noon on November 20th. And this is a great thing. And as soon as I get him pinned down, um, I'll email that out to everyone and sign up as quickly as you can, because I think we only do 16 spots on those. Um, that is it for that. Does, um, I guess I'll just ask, does anybody have some great news, any or, or other news? I know that um, I had one person that wanted to ask a question and I don't see her here tonight, but anybody have any cool news about publishing. Andrew Smiley has a new baby. That's even better than a book. Congratulations on that. Speak up if you've got anything. I got two um, turnaround rejections over the last two days. Like, I don't even think they looked at my query letter. It was just a quick no. So, but at least I'm back to submitting. All right, well, then without further ado, I'm going to pass this on to Mary Krakow, who is our uh, featured reader coordinator, and she's gonna introduce our reader for tonight. So Mary, it's all you. Thanks, Mike. Um, before I introduce our reader for tonight, um, I wanna do a little plug for the December holiday gathering where we um, have members read. Um, this year, in keeping with Central Oregon Writers Guild's goal to advance growth and success for individual writers of all genres and skill levels, the first five slots of our December holiday virtual gathering will be reserved for first time readers. So if you have never read for our group, we wanna hear what you're working on. It's your chance to shine. Choose something you have written that can be read in four to seven minutes. So that's approximately 600 to a thousand words. It doesn't need to be holiday related. And the meeting will be virtual, so you can invite your friends, your family, and we want to celebrate you. Once those first five slots are filled, um, additional slots will open for returning readers, people who have read before. Um, and then just contact me at marykrakow at gmail.com. I think Mike's going to send something out to the membership, um, and we'll find a spot for you on the schedule. Uh, if you're a first time reader, please indicate that in the subject line, because I, I do want to, I, I really want to get some people who haven't read before um, involved and, in, in, um, you know, it's easy to think, oh, I've never done it. I don't want to do it. I'm not good enough. But none of that is true. We, we want to hear what you have to say. And um, and that's my plug for December. Okay. And Mary, yes. I assume that if you have read before and you want to read again, email you anyway, and then you'll just put people in order as you get them, right? That's, yeah, that's good. Okay. And I think we had about, uh, we did have about 10 readers last time. 
So I'm hoping we get half new readers and half returning readers. That's, that's what I'm hopeful. Um, and you know what? If we have 15 people sign up, we'll just go longer. <laughs> okay, now on to tonight's featured reader. Rebecca Miller wrote her first novel in fifth grade. It was a sprawling 72 page tour de force about a pair of rich twins. Since then, most of her writing has been in the form of poetry from angst ridden teenage melodramas to more recent reflections on topics ranging from parenting to menopause to heartache to observations of the absurd. Though she grew up in the suburbs of Washington DC, she currently resides in Bend, Oregon with her cat Bo where she explores the scenic Pacific Northwest and devours books, podcasts, and music. She has just completed her second novel, Releasing the Dove, a multifaceted story about the thin line between love and obsession and the power circumstances can have over our perceptions. Her first novel, Dear Z, was published in 2018, a story of three siblings growing up in Europe during World War II. She has also published a collection of poetry titled 11. Please welcome tonight's reader, Rebecca Miller. Thank you, Mary. It was really fun writing that bio. I hate talking about myself, but it was fun. Um, okay, so this is actually the proof copy of the book that's coming out. You can't really see it, but it's the most beautiful cover art ever that my best friend did. Uh, she also did the cover art for my other book. And we got to look at the proof, and boy, did we find a lot of mistakes. So really glad that we, we looked it over before we sent it out. Um, but I'm going to be reading a small piece from that. I think we'll give you just a little taste of what the story is about. <clears throat> As New York's skyline slid into view, the mindless chatter on the train ceased, and the faces turned toward the view in stunned silence. If she hadn't known better, Victoria would not, now, would not have known what city she now approached, so foreign was its appearance. The telltale towers no longer protruded skyward. Sadness and respect filled her as she half closed her eyes and made a feeble attempt at prayer. The wounds felt fresh, the pain still raw. As the train pulled in to Penn Station, Victoria checked her lipstick in a small mirror sewn into the flap of her purse. All she had with her was her camera and the purse. In it were her driver's license and a credit card, the folded paper with the train times, some cash for cabs, her lipstick, and her cell phone. She held onto her purse as she stepped off the train with the crowd. She moved along with the herd, pushing her way up a flight of stairs into the main lobby of the station. People milled around, looking up at the suspended departure board with its constantly changing train times. Victoria followed the signs to the exit, walked out of the station, and into the city bustle. She somehow expected a pall to have fallen over the city, for recent events to have taken the spring out of people's steps, for faces to be drawn and lifeless. By all appearances, however, nothing had slowed down a bit. Cabs lined the sidewalk, cars and buses honked and pulled out into traffic, people cascaded in every direction, and the city felt completely alive. She walked to the holding area and waited for the next available taxi. As it pulled up to the curb and she climbed in, she told the driver the address she had memorized. The driver was no more cautious than any taxi driver she'd been driven by in the past. Nothing was moving any more slowly or carefully than before 9-11. The cabbie swerved in and out of traffic, honking at people in his path, cursing and looking wildly around for an opening. There wasn't any newfound respect for human life or new politeness paid to the brotherhood of man. New York, look, New York looked the way it had always looked, at least at first. The cab smelled faintly spicy and more strongly of male sweat. The cab driver's name was Luis Santiago, according to the cabbie license hanging from the dashboard. He didn't say much, only listened to a Latin radio station as he maniacally drove the streets. Sometimes cabbies talked nonstop, trying to engage you in mindless conversation or tell you about their lives. Not Luis. He was perfectly happy to ignore his fare. He suddenly stopped in the middle of the street, pulling up next to a curb on the right that bordered Central Park. I only go this far. You have to walk down there, he said, and he waved his hand indiscriminately down a street to the left. Is this the right address, she asked, not seeing any churches nearby. Yes, but you have to walk the rest of the way, okay? Okay, she said haltingly. The fare came to 875. She handed him a 10 and stepped out of the car. She crossed the busy intersection as the cab pulled away and began walking down the street he'd pointed to. 
New Yorkers walk, she thought, and I'm in New York, so I'll walk. She put on an air of acceptance and looked up at the life pulsating around her. The side street she now navigated was quieter, less traveled than the road onto which she'd gotten out of the taxi. It was lined with what seemed to be homes and small businesses. Here and there grew streets coming up through... <laughs> Here and there grew trees coming up through squares of soil enclosed in short iron wrought edging that interrupted the sidewalk. Parked cars lined the curbs, so close together it seemed they'd pulled in one after the other in a long line. She wondered how they would ever pull away from the curb again. Would everyone wait for the first car in line to leave and then follow one by one? She walked a couple of blocks but still saw nothing resembling a church. It was just after four o'clock. She pulled out her cell phone and dialed Sandy. Sandy's husband Bob answered. Hey, Bob, guess what I forgot? My wedding invitation. I don't know the name of the church, and I'm not sure where I'm going. Could you read me the name again and maybe look it up on MapQuest? She walked while she talked, feeling that this was how New Yorkers behaved, always a cell phone to their ear as they hurried to the next appointment or meeting. Bob came back on the line and gave her the name of the church. It should be coming up any moment. For false security, Victoria kept Bob on the phone as she walked, somehow feeling like as long as she was connected to a voice, she was okay. She soon approached some parked cars with passengers who were dressed up, carrying some gifts. Victoria had sent the William and Sonoma wooden mixing spoon set on ahead of her, not wanting to have to carry it with her as she traveled. She got off the phone with Bob, thanking him for keeping her company, and crossed the street to enter what she now realized was the church. From the outside, it was a low, flat building built of bricks of a nondescript color with windows that showed nothing on the other side. There was a long, covered walkway that snaked down from the entrance to the sidewalk and street. She now noticed it was crowded with people. As she approached the building and moved through the melange of faces, she recognized some, but rather than stopping to say hello, she hurried past, wanting desperately to find a bathroom. Thank you, Rebecca. That was wonderful. Thanks, Rebecca. I totally understand not wanting to risk the William Sonoma wooden spoon set. Yeah, I'm 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 that type of person too. Um, <clears throat> I thought that Andrew's new baby was crying in the background, but I realized it's supper time for your cat, isn't it? I'm afraid. I'm afraid so. No way to yeah. avoid that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I uh, Rebecca put a, a note in the um, chat there. Um, she is looking for someone to help her with PDF covers and PDF inside resources, which I don't really know what that means. But if anybody else does and they, are, and they know how to do it, you can um, just direct um, chat Rebecca and uh, or if you know someone, maybe um, help her out with that. Uh, that's, a but, that's a different Rebecca, not me, though. Just oh, FYI. sorry, Rebecca Locklear. Uh, it's in the chat, right? Yeah. Sorry, I forgot there's people that have more than uh, people have same names. Um, okay, let's get on with our uh, featured presenter tonight. Um, Ellen Santisero is going to talk to us about what it's all about. Um, Ellen, <clears throat> the only thing that Ellen Santisero likes better than making essays, memoirs, collages, plays, fictions, and safe spaces for learning is making them with others. Uh, her work has appeared in The Stay Project, The Sun, 7x7 Seven Seven LA, and The High Desert Journal, um, among others. Ellen taught at OSU for 15 years, taught writing at OSU for 15 years. She's recently retired uh, and moving on to uh, the project that I mentioned earlier and um, her own memoir classes and editorial work. Uh, Ellen is a dear friend of mine and a wonderful writer and a great teacher. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say tonight. So let's welcome Ellen. Great. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Wow, there's a lot of people here, um, some of whom I recognize. Carolyn, Judy, Carrie, Randy. Is that Dana Clark out there? Um, Eliza, of course, Mike and Irene. Um, and for those, oh, thanks, Carrie. Um, and for, for those of you who I don't know, I hope to meet you someday. So in person, that is. So yeah, what's it all about? Um, so that 
that uh, sounds like I know what it's all about. Um, so what I'm going to talk about tonight is um, aboutness. So I always put that in air quotes um, because for me, it's the only word that kind of um, captures what I mean when I talk about what a piece of writing is about. Hi, Dana. All right. Um, so um, this is sounding very abstract. So I'm going to jump right into a concrete example. Um, so it can be difficult to figure out what we're writing about, um, especially if we're writing a long work or a complicated work. And I want to make a distinction uh, between theme and aboutness. So when I talk about aboutness, I'm not talking about theme. They're, they're different things. And I'll give you an example. So memoir is kind of my genre, the genre that I read and write most. Can you guys see this? Um, educated by Tara Westover. Oh. If you hold it right in front of your face, it should, <laughs> nope, never mind. <laughs> okay, let me get yeah. rid of the green screen. Okay, you guys can see it. Yes, thank you, Ellen. Yeah, so um, Educated by Tara Westover. The memoir came out in 2018. <clears throat> so when this book came out and people were, you know, writing about it and reviewing it, um, a lot of people were saying that Educated was about the value and importance of higher education. And that according to my definition of aboutness is not what it's about. Higher education is a theme in this book, certainly, as is um, fundamentalist living, um, you know, bringing children up in fundamentalist households. Those are themes. But the aboutness is actually right here, stated on page 304. So I'm gonna show you that so that you can see it up close. I'm gonna share my screen. And go right to page 304 so that you guys can connect with what I'm talking about. So on page 304, which is near the end, she says, <clears throat> for those of you who haven't read it, I'll just give you a very brief, um, you know, catching up to this page. Um, Tara Westover, raised in a fundamentalist family in the West and um, never went to school. and um, ends up going to, um, I think it's Harvard, and then to Oxford, um, becomes highly educated, formally educated, but never had any, you know, grade school, elementary or high school education, and um, becomes very successful in a particular kind of way that our culture recognizes, and um, through that, and she also suffers um, physical and emotional abuse, abuse at the hands of her brother. So here on page 304, she's trying to break away from her family through the whole book. Um, sorry if I'm spoiling this for those who haven't read it, but um, for the purposes of my talk tonight, um, I need to talk about these things. So she says her father, she's at Harvard, her father comes and father and mother come to visit her and her father's trying to reel her in constantly back to the, the religion. And he says to her, I will offer right up at the top here, I will offer one final time to give you a blessing. And what that means is, you know, to bring you back into the fold. And if you accept it, that means you'll, you know, you'll leave this life of higher education and come back to us. And um, she says, you know, if I accept the blessing, I'm going to jump right to here. This is what this book is about right here. Everything I had worked for all my years of study had been to purchase for myself this one privilege, colon, to see and experience more truths than those given to me by my father and to use those truths to construct my own mind. I had come to believe that the ability to evaluate many ideas, many histories, many points of view was at the heart of what it means to self-create. If I yielded now, in other words, took the blessing, I would lose more than an argument. I would lose custody 
of my own mind. This is what the entire book is about. Um, you know, if you want to argue with me, we can argue later, but I, bear with me, you know, for the hour or so that we have together. Um, that this is what the book is about. It's not about higher education, right? It's about this. It's about her maintaining, standing by, and um, claiming her own self, her own mind, her own desires, right? Her own life, and not going back to her father's world. So um, I'm going to stop right there and see um, if there are questions about the difference between theme and aboutness. Mike, are you looking at the chat for me? Okay. Okay. But yeah, anybody you can sing out or put it in the chat if you have a, a question about what I've said so far about educated. Everybody good? Okay, so um, <clears throat> just, you know, to sum it up that there are all kinds of themes, you know, there's sibling abuse, there's fundamentalist religion, there is living um, off the grid, living off the land, all of that, very heavy in the book, a lot of that. Um, there's, you know, the starting of a home business, which becomes very successful. Um, there's... Um, a kind of parenting where there isn't a whole lot of concern for the children's um, safety, physical safety. Um, there's higher education, there's leaving one's home, leaving one's family. Um, but those are all themes. This is what it's about. Um, so what would you say is the theme of education? So yeah, so Judy, um, yeah, those things I just listed, does that answer your question? And you might be muted because I can't hear you. Ellen, is there not one overriding theme that you would consider to be the theme of educated as opposed to the many individual threads that you mentioned as possible themes? You said there's one aboutness. Is there not one overriding theme? that you would consider the primary theme well, of it? Sure, um, broadly coming of age, you know, um, differentiating oneself from one's family, that's broadly, but under that umbrella, we have a million books, right? There are a million coming of age stories. So that's not, that's, that's too big for us as writers. We need to really drill down and get to an aboutness that is as, specific is Tara Westover's right here that I've got boxed in on page 304. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. And then in the chat, somebody else said, um, so it's about this, the internal conflict. Um, yeah, Mary, that is a place to look. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're going to do an exercise tonight where I want you to take a piece of writing that you're working on. And um, that will be a place to look at the internal conflict. And probably that's where you're gonna find your aboutness and, my, and you might be able to even sharpen it, which is what I want you to do. Um, Eliza, absolutely, I agree. Having read it, agency, very first basic freedom and essential survivor's quest. Yeah, um, there can be multiple themes, but one overarching aboutness. That's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, I'm asking you to go with me. <laughs> on that for the next hour you know after that we can you know we can throw tomatoes and argue about, about all that but in for our purposes tonight I'm asking you to sign on to that you know my my um my argument that there is one aboutness there can be many themes but there's one aboutness and the more that you can identify that and and become crystal clear about it um it will help you move forward with your work. Okay, so um, feel free to ask questions at any point. 
I'm going to move on to, I'm going to show you um, a PDF and I'll share all of these things with you um, of some aboutnesses that I've identified from shorter pieces. So, you know, this is a very, uh, educated is a very long 400 page or so book or 350 or so page book, but you can do an aboutness for shorter pieces as well. Um, and these are, these are all essays. These are personal essays, um, again, because that's my, my, my favorite um, type of writing. And you may or may not have read these. It doesn't matter. I just want to show you that they can be really short. And so my family did not process grief, and I wish it had. So if you read Bones by Teresa Jordan, you might think it's about ranching. You might think it's about a ranching family that ends up losing their ranch and, you know, having to move on, but it's really about this. Because she talks about broken bones through the entire piece, but when you really read it very closely, which is what you want to do as a writer, right? You want to be a very close, sharp reader. You see that this is the aboutness. Total Eclipse by Annie Dillard, the aboutness. Universe is an awesome place and we are inspired by it, but also tiny and powerless within it. Devil's Fate by Leslie Jameson. I am curious about empathy, what it is and why we give it or don't give it. I actively investigate it and don't find any clear conclusion. Now, if you read Devil's Fate by Leslie James Jameson, what you read on the page is that she attends a conference for people who who say they have Morgellons disease, which is a, a very rare and controversial condition that doctors don't believe exists, but these people absolutely insist that they have it. But this is what it's about. It's not about Morgellons disease, it's about this. Leslie Jameson is trying to figure out, you know, most people think these people are crazy, but I wanna give them empathy. She wants to give them empathy. And she's having a hard time doing it because she doesn't really quite believe them either. Unnamed Caves by John Jeremiah Sullivan. There is mysterious phenomena in the world and we don't know much of what it means. We are humbled by it. Oye a Beaumont by Vicki Hearn is all about, um, she's a dog trainer and it's all about um, the death of dogs, the death of pets, uh, dogs in particular. Some say the death of a pet is not serious. My and others' experiences says it is. Dealing with such grief is the test of a man or woman. Driving at Night, a chorus. This is the last one um, by Carol Pagel. Meditation on and doubts about seeing vision and visual perception. How can we know anything if we can't trust our perceptions? We are humbled. There's one more, but I'm not going to show it to you because I'm going to have you guys read something. And then in small groups, talk about what you think the aboutness is, and then I'll share what I think it is. Okay, so before I switch gears, any questions about these shorter statements of aboutness? Okay. All right. Yeah, I have a question. Okay, go for it, Karen. Um. Uh, in each of these examples, did you just pull a sentence or two from the actual text? In other words, mm -hmm. did the author actually write these and state their meaning, or did you paraphrase? I, I, yeah, I paraphrased. Okay. So yeah. the author, which kind of makes me suspect that sometimes the authors don't quite recognize what their book is about either. I would say that they do. And that brings up a point I was going to make that you don't actually have to state it, but every single thing in your piece better be telling the reader what it is. Your aboutness drives every decision in your writing. It drives everything. It drives the imagery. It drives the epigraph at the beginning of the book. Everything hinges on the aboutness. And if it doesn't, your reader's going to be confused. They're going to be like, Why, what, what direction are we going in here? Okay, any, but so thanks for asking about that. 
Um, so especially in fiction, like, like in nonfiction, we're more, I think we're more apt to see it like in Tara Westover's, you know, I read directly from her text um, in fiction, I would say probably less so. It's going to be implied by everything else. It's going to be implied by the imagery, right, by the dialogue, by the characterization, by the kid, you know, the development of the characters, all of that. Okay, so let's, um, so we have till seven o'clock. And so I want you to get started on reading. Uh, it's a short essay, it's nonfiction, and it's only five and a half pages, but you know, pages like that. Um, so I'm gonna put you in groups of two and I want you all to read it and then discuss with your partner what you think the aboutness is. So I want you to, together or alone, come up with a sentence like this, a paraphrase like I've got here. And it's right here, how to get out of a locked trunk. And I'm gonna share the PDF with you in the, oops, in the chat. Chat, I think, can I do that? Um, I think if you have a link, you can paste it into the chat and we might be able to open it. Okay, let me move, let me put this down. Put that down. Let's see. That down. Can I just go like that? No. Um, I think you open it and then you. Um, Take that link um, wherever you have a link. You might uh, not be able to do it. Like a share? It's a document. I don't know. Paige, do you know if you can share documents in? Yeah. PDF. It's a P I don't know why I can't share a PDF. It seems like I should be able to. Um, OK. So maybe I'll do half and have Mike do half. Okay, on a hot Sunday last summer, my friend Tony and I drove my rental car, a 91 Buick from St. Paul to the small town of Waconia, Minnesota, 40 miles southwest. Everybody okay? Oh, Randy's got it here. Um, we each had a project. Waconia is Tony's boyhood home. And his sister had recently given him a panoramic postcard of Lake Waconia, a scene from a high point in the town early in the century. He wanted to duplicate the photograph's vantage point, then hang the two pictures together in his house in Frogtown. I was hoping to see Tony's father, Emmett, a retired mechanic, in order to settle a question that had been nagging at me. Is it possible to get out of a locked car trunk? We tried to call ahead to Emmett twice, but he wasn't home. Tony thought he was probably golfing, but that there was a good chance he'd be back by the time we got there. So we set out. I parked the Buick, which was a silver sedan with a red interior by the graveyard near where Tony thought the picture had been taken. He took his picture and I wandered among the headstones reading the epitaphs. One of them was chillingly anti-individualist. It said, not to do my will, but thine. Trunk lockings had been on my mind for a few weeks. It seemed to me that the fear of being locked in a car trunk had a particular hold on the American imagination. Trunk lockings occur in many movies and books, from Goodfellas to Thelma and Louise to Humboldt's Gift. And while the highbrow national newspapers generally shy away from trunk lockings, the attention they receive in local papers suggests the widespread anxiety surrounding the subject. In an afternoon at the New York Pub Public Library, I found numerous stories about trunk lockings. A Los Angeles man is discovered, bloodshot, banging the trunk of his white El Dorado following a night and day trapped inside. He says his captors went on joy rides and picked up women. A 48-year-old Houston doctor is forced into her trunk at a, at a bank ATM, and then the car is abandoned, parked near the Astrodome. A New Orleans woman tells police she gave birth in a trunk while being abducted to Texas. Tests undermine her story, the police drop the investigation. But so what if it's a fantasy? That only shows the idea's hold on us. Every culture comes up with tests of a person's ability to get out of a sticky situation. The English plant mazes, 
Tropical resorts market those straw finger grabbers that tighten their grip the harder you pull on them. And Viennese intellectuals gave us the concept of childhood sexuality, figure it out or remain neurotic for life. At least you could puzzle your way out of those predicaments. When they slam the trunk though, you're helpless unless someone finds you. You would think that such a common worry should have a ready fix and that the secret of getting out of a locked trunk is something we should all know about. I phoned experts, but they were very discouraging. Quote, you cannot get out. If you got a pair of pliers and bat size, yes, but you have to have a lot of knowledge of the lock, said James Foote at Automotive Locksmiths in New York City. Jim Friends, whom I reached at the technical section of Car and Driver in Detroit, told me the magazine had not dealt with this question, but he echoed the opinion of experts elsewhere when he said that the best hope for escape would be to try and kick out the panel between the trunk and the back seat. That angle didn't seem worth pursuing. What if your enemies were in the car, crumpling beer cans and laughing at your fate? It didn't make sense to join them. The people who deal with rules on auto design were uncomfortable with my scenarios. Deborah Barclay of the Center for Auto Safety, an organization founded by Ralph Nader, had certainly heard of cases, but she was not aware of any regulations on the matter. Now, if there was a defect involved, she said, her voice trailing off, implying that trunk locking was all phobia. This must be one of the few issues on which she and the auto industry agree. Ann Carlson of the Motor Vehicle Manufacturing Association became alarmed at the thought that I was going to play up a non-problem. Quote, in reality, this very rarely happens. As you say, in the movies, it's a wonderful plot device, she said. But in reality, apparently, this is not that frequent an occurrence. So they have not designed that feature into vehicles in a specific way, unquote. When we got to Emmett's one-story house, it was full of people. Tony's sister, Carol, was on the floor with her two small children. Her husband, Charlie, had one eye on the golf tournament on TV, and Emmett was at the kitchen counter, trimming fat from meat for lunch. I've known Emmett for 15 years. He looked better than ever. In his retirement, he had sharply changed his diet and lost a lot of weight. He had on shorts. His legs were tanned and muscular. As always, his manner was humorous, if opaque. Tony told his family my news. I was getting married in three weeks. Charlie wanted to know where my fiance was. Back east, getting everything ready. A big time hatter was fitting her for a new hat. Emmett sat on the couch watching me. Do you want my advice? Sure. He just grinned. A gold tooth glinted. Carol and Charlie pressed him to yield his wisdom. Finally, he said, once you get to be 30, you make your own mistakes. He got out several cans of beer, and then I brought up what was on my mind. Emmett nodded and took off his glasses, then cleaned them and put them back on. We went out to his car, Mercury Grand Marquis, and Emmett opened the trunk. His golf clubs were sitting on top of the spare tire in a green golf bag. Next to them was a toolbox and what he called his burglar tools, a set of elbowed rods with red plastic handles he used to open door locks when people locked their keys inside. Tony and Charlie stood watching. Charlie is a banker in Minneapolis. He enjoys gizmos and, extreme, and is extremely practical. I would describe him as unflappable. That's a word I always wanted to apply to myself, but my fiance had recently informed me that I am high strung. Though that surprised me, I didn't quarrel with her. For a while, we studied the latch assembly. The lock closed in much the same way that a lobster might clamp onto a pencil. The claw portion, the jaws of the lock, was mounted inside the trunk lid. When you shut the lid, the jaws locked onto the bend of a U-shaped piece of metal mounted on the body of the car. Emmett said my best bet would be to unscrew the bolts. That way the U-shaped piece would come loose and the lock's jaws would swing up with it still in their grasp. But you'd need a wrench, he said. It was already getting too technical. Emmett had an air of endless patience, but I felt defeated. I could only imagine bloodied fingers, cracked teeth. I had hoped for a simple trick. Charlie stepped forward. He reached out and squeezed the lock's jaws. They clicked shut in the air, bound together by heavy springs. Charlie now prodded the upper left part of the left-hand jaw, the thicker part. With a rough flick of his thumb, he was able to force the jaws to snap open. Great. Unfortunately, the jaws were mounted behind a steel plate the size of your palm in such a way that while they were accessible to us, standing outside the car, had we been inside the trunk, the plate would be in our way, blocking the jaws. This time, Emmett saw the way out. He fingered a hole in the, in the plate. 
It was no bigger than the, the tip of your little finger, but the hole was close enough to the latch itself that it might be possible to angle something through the hole from the inside, of, inside the trunk and nudge the jaws apart. We tried with one of my keys, the lock jumped open. It was time for a full dress test. Emmett swung the clubs out of the trunk and I set my can of Schmitz on the rear bumper and climbed in. Everyone gathered around and Emmett lowered the trunk on me, then pressed it shut with his meaty hands. Total darkness. I couldn't hear the people outside. I thought I was going to panic, but the big trunk felt comfortable. I was pressed against a sort of black carpet, softened the angles against my back. I could almost stretch out in the trunk and it seemed to me I could make them sweat if I took my time. Even Emmett, that sphinx would give way to curiosity. Once I was out, he'd asked how it had been and I'd just grin. There were some things you could only learn by doing. It took a while to find the hole. I slipped the key in and angled it to one side. The trunk gasped open. Emmett motioned, to the, motioned the others away, then levered me out with his big right forearm. Though I'd only been inside for a minute, I was disoriented as much as anything because someone had moved my beer while I was gone, setting it down on the cement floor of the garage. It was just a little thing, but I could not be entirely sure if I'd gotten my own beer back. Charlie was raring to try other cars. We examined the latch on his Toyota, which was entirely shielded to the trunk occupant, i.e. no hole in the plate, and on the neighbor's Honda, ditto. But a 1991 Dodge Dynasty was doable. The trunk was tight, but its lock had a feature, one of the me mechanics I'd phoned described as a, quote, tailpiece, a finger-like extension of the lock mechanism itself that stuck out a half inch into the trunk cavity. Simply by twisting the tailpiece, I could free the lock. I was even faster on a 1984 Subaru that had a little lever device on the latch. Okay, Mike, do you want to read? We went out to my rental. We went out to my rental on Oak Street. The Skylark was in direct sun and the trunk was hot to the touch. But when we got it open, we could see that its latch plate had a perfect hole, a square in which the edge of the lock's jaw appeared like a face in a window. The trunk was shallow and hot. Emmett had to push my knees down before he could close the lid. This one was a little suffocating. I imagined being trapped for hours, and even before he had got it closed, I regretted the decision with a slightly nauseous feeling. I thought of Edgar Allan Poe's live burials, and then about something my fiance had said more than a year and a half before. I had been on her case to get married. She was divorced, and at every opportunity, I would reissue my proposal, even during a commercial. She'd interrupted one of those chirps to tell me in a cold, throaty voice that she had no intention of ever going through another divorce. This time, it's death out. I'd carried those words around like a lump of wet clay. As it happened, the Skylark trunk was the easiest of all. The hole was right where it was supposed to be. The trunk popped open, and I felt great satisfaction that we'd been able to figure out a rule that seemed to apply about 60% of the time. If we publicized our success, it might get the attention it deserved. All trunks would be fitted with such a hole. Kids would learn about it in school. The grip of the fear would relax. Before long, a successful trunk locking scene would date a movie like a fedora dates one today. When I got back east, I was caught up in wedding preparations. I live in New York, and the wedding was to take place in Philadelphia. We set up camp there with five days to go. A friend had lent her fiancé her BMW, and we drove it south with all our things. I unloaded the car in my parents' driveway. The last thing I pulled out of the trunk was my fiancé's hat and its heavy cardboard shipping box. She'd warned me I was not allowed to look. The lid was free, but I didn't open it. I was willing to be surprised. When the trunk was empty, it occurred to me I might hop in and give it a try. First, I looked over the mechanism. The jaws of the BMW's lock were shielded shielded, but there seemed to be some kind of cable coming off it that you might be able to manipulate so as to cause the lock to open, the same cable that allowed the driver to open the trunk remotely. I fingered it for a moment or two, but decided I didn't need to test out the theory. That's it. Thank you. Okay, so, um, 
So why don't we, instead of going into groups, um, let's take five minutes and take some notes, jot down your thoughts about what you think the aboutness is. So remember, we're going for, you know, a short statement like this, <clears throat> a short paraphrase. And also um, notice uh, themes. And um, I'll time you for five minutes.
Okay, so um, it looks like several people have um, put a paraphrase in the chat box. Um, thank you for that. And if you'd like to speak it, um, I'd love to hear it. Um, for anybody who didn't write one yet, um, and you'd like to just say it instead of type it, um, you can do that now. Anybody? Anybody want to speak theirs? If uh, no one would like to say them out loud, that's just fine. But Ellen, if you don't mind reading some of the ones from the chat, so that we capture them on the recording. There's a lot of good sure. content there that I'd hate to lose. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. Um, Judy, do you want to read yours? Sure. Go for it. This article is about tests of a person's ability to get out of a sticky situation whether, and if so, how it may be possible to escape a seemingly inescapable trap, such as a locked trunk, or a marriage to a fiance who warns the author her next marriage must be until death. Thank you, thank you. Uh, before I read the rest of them, anybody else wanna speak theirs? Randy, go for it. Sure, I'll just read basically what I typed. Getting out of a locked trunk is easier than getting out of the marriage I was about to enter into. Okay, okay. anybody else? Where I read them? Okay, I will read them. Um, Christine says, he already feels trapped by his marriage and doesn't know how to escape. So he's accepted the fact marriage or the trunk is his coffin. Rebecca, marriage can be claustrophobic and you can feel like you're trapped, but if you pre prepare for it, you can always figure out an escape. Eliza, how to stay, stay calm in times of chaos. There is always a way out if you know how to manipulate the lock. Andrew, the value of the lesson is found in the bumps and jangles of the journey, not the ultimate destination. Uh, Randy read his, Mary, lock trunks and marriage are sticky situations. By solving the lock trunk problem, he feels confident he can survive marriage. Brian, regaining mastery of our phobias, finding a way out. Carolyn, narrator is frightened to enter a marriage from which his partner will allow no escape. Amber, we like to believe we are in control, but it's a myth. Uh, Anna Lee, life is full of scary unknowns, but that's okay, live life anyway. All right, good job, you guys. Really good. So, um, so here's what I came up with. I am afraid of commitment, marriage, and I actively try to resolve that. In the process, I learn and grow and become able to commit. So, um, yeah, I mean, we all of you're all within, you know the realm of this aboutness with what you what you all stated or read the guy's scared right he's scared to get married and he's got this wonderful metaphor going on right with the locked trunk so you know probably 95 percent of the essay is about trunk mechanisms right and scenes of him getting in and out of trunks but this is what it's about right this is what it's about. There's another 
uh, I think Randy hits the nail on the head, proverbial head. Does one's own experience with marriage color how you interpret this piece? Hmm, that's a good question. Probably, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I think you all got it. I think you all, um, you know, stated it um, in different ways, but you all basically got it. Yep. So questions about that before we move on to another exercise. This next exercise, I want you to take um, focus on your own writing, a piece that you're writing right now. It could be book length or essay length, whatever. Um, marriage sometimes feels like a limo that turns into a trunk. <laughs> yeah, this is a, this is a rich uh, subject for sure. Okay, so um, hopefully you got something valuable out of that critical reading experience that you can take forward. Now I want to have you uh, do an exercise that I call a, a, the blurb exercise. So I'm going to go to my PowerPoint. Where is it? There it is. Okay. So um, we did that. So um, this is an exercise that I that I have done for myself for the memoir that I'm working on. And um, what I do, what I did, and what I um, guide people to do is to take just to take a blurb from a book jacket, any one you want. Doesn't matter. I picked this one because I liked it. And, um, you know, this is marketing copy, right? So there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of hyperbole, a lot of superlatives. Um, so just let, just let those fall away. Um, when you look at this, I want you to, we're going to use this one as a template just because, you know, we have what, like a half hour left. So, but, you know, going forward from this talk, you can do this again with a different blurb, but this is the one that I want you, to, want you to use for tonight. So what I kept from this for myself, I use this as a template and um, I let the superlatives fall away and I just used her grammar and I plugged in my own story. And so, um, and her dazzling abandoned me, Phoebos captures the intense bonds of love and the need for connection with family, lovers, and oneself. First, her birth father, who left her with only an inheritance of addiction and Native American blood, its meaning a mystery. As Phoebos tentatively reconnects, she sees how both these lineages manifest in her own life, marked by compulsion and an instinct for self erasure. Meanwhile, she remains closely tied to the sea captain who raised her, his parenting ardent but intermittent as his work took him away for months at a time. Woven throughout is the hypnotic story of an all-consuming long-distance love affair with a woman marked equally by worship and withdrawal. In visceral erotic prose, Phoebos captures their mutual abandonment to passion and obsession and the terror and, and exhilaration of losing herself in another. At once a fearlessly vulnerable memoir and an incisive investigation of art, love, and identity, Abandon Me draws on childhood stories, religion, psychology, mythology, popular culture, and the intimacies of one writer's life to reveal intellectual and emotional truths that feel startlingly universal. So um, I took this and I took my memoir that I was working on at the time. Okay, next page. Um, and it, which is still a work in progress. And so is my blurb. And so the idea for this exercise, I'm going to ask you to write something similar to what Melissa Phoebos wrote. And it's an exercise, right? So it's not going to be set in stone. I just want you to, to want you to practice plugging in your own story, the particulars of your own story into her grammar. So I have, I'll come back to this in a second. Here's the template. And literally, you know, this is like Mad Libs, right? You know, it's silly and it's goofy, but for me, it was powerful and helpful. It helped me discern and figure out. My book is about this. It's not about this over here. It's about this over here. So um, this is set up for memoir, but you could, you could write yours. If you're writing a novel, you could say in this novel, right? So don't get hung up on some of this language. So in this, whatever, 
blank, that's your name, your name goes right here. Blank captures whatever you capture, you think you're capturing when she, he, or they, you know, an incisive look at. Um, so again, bear with me, go with me on this ride, even if it seems silly and, um, you know, stupid or irrelevant or whatever. Um, allow this exercise to open you up to see what emerges. So for me, um, here's how mine came out. In this personal narrative, Ellen Santosiro captures the intense search for mental health and wholeness far from family, friends, and familiar landscapes. So you see, I used Phoebos' grammar, but I plugged in my story. When her life and mental state become unbearable in the urban East, she leaves for the forested West. An inquiry into the geographical cure now faced West is both a tale of mental health stigma at every level of our society and the spirit of a young woman who found herself living in a world that forbade her to explore her sexual orientation. The great granddaughter of immigrant ancestors who successfully relocated West to find a better life, she moves to Oregon and discovers the truth about the geographical cure. Woven throughout is the story of the building of an artist's life, a vulnerable story about the ways culture both shapes and releases us from our destiny now Face West draws on personal memory, history, religion, psychology, mythology, and popular culture. Now, have I written this yet? Not all of it. I'm writing towards this blurb. So there's a, an iterative process between the memoir that I'm writing and this blurb. And as I go along the way, I'm changing some things about the blurb too, because I'm realizing that, yeah, you know, maybe I really don't want to talk about mythology or whatever. So you get it. This is meant to be a living kind of blurb that can change, will change, probably change. It's, it's meant to give you some direction and some clarity about whatever you're writing. So um, I'm gonna give you, we're gonna take the rest of the time. We've got 20 minutes and I want you to have all that time um, because it's gonna take time and um, you're gonna, probably keep working on it after this. I hope you do. Um, and I will take questions along the way if you have one, but go ahead and use the template again, which I, I can't seem to share with you. Um, Ellen, I, I feel like it might be easier, at least for me to have the original Okay. Book cover rather than the template because I can't remember what's supposed to go in the spaces. <laughs> Got it. So, um, yeah, this I one. I agree with Rebecca on that. On yours, maybe. This yours one? or this one? Which one do you think, Rebecca? Either. Whichever. Either yeah. one, just so I can see it. Okay, hers has more detail in it than mine does, so I don't know what's easier. Um, do you have an example for fiction? Not right at the moment, but but you know what? You can do the same thing for fiction. Just put in your protagonist, right? So in this novel, you know, whatever your protagonist's name is, you know, John Jones does what? What does he, what does he do or she do? Um, is there more questionnaire below that you showed us? Looks like it continues. Yes, it does continue. It just basically has this grammar, Judy, with the spaces. So another thing I want to say before you start is another way to find your aboutness is if you have a climax in your story already, some of you might have a climax already, look there. And as somebody said earlier, if you, have an in, if you have an internal conflict already with your character, look there for the aboutness and work with that and try, yes, I can share everything with you um, and it'll be on the library website for sure. Um, so questions at this point. I just want to see the, the questionnaire that you had. Okay. Um, if you so, could put up both, maybe. Sure. Yeah. Um, pretend again. So pretend that you've been given the job of writing a book jacket blurb for this book. It's your book and pretend that you've got to write it. That's, that's what this exercise is about. So 
Randy, so in this whatever, this could be novel, right? Right. Um, blank, your name. And then you could change that verb if you want. Um, if this could be your protagonist, it doesn't have to be your name. If it's fiction, it could be the protagonist does what? Travels, explores, discovers, falls, um, falls ill and recover, you know, what happens? Is an incisive look at what? Your novel is an incisive look at what? It's a tale of what? The name of your novel or memoir is a tale of what? Um, with blank, you or your protagonist discover what? Woven throughout is what? <laughs> and it's an investigation of, you guys following me? So which one are you leaving up? Because if, if you, if some more people would rather have this, I, I just want to take a picture of your other one then. So I, can I, can... Do both. I can do both. Oh, I'm you gonna... can do both. That would be awesome. Yeah, I'm going to go like this. Um, I'm going to put both up. Perfect. Wait. Um, do, 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 do. Now, can you guys see, oh, sorry. Can you guys see, um, can you see everything now? That's that it. Works. That works for me. Okay, try to come up with something. You don't have to have the whole thing. Try to come up with something in 15 minutes and I'll time you.
Ellen, this is hard. Sorry.
One minute. All right, go ahead and finish the sentence you're working on, please. Okay, so, um, so how many people, you can raise your hand, um, how many people would be willing to share all or part of what they wrote? Okay, Rebecca, Randy, Amber, uh, Trudy. Okay, let's go in that exact order. Rebecca, Randy, Amber, Trudy, and then anybody else who wants to jump on after Trudy. I may have trouble reading my own writing. This was a hot mess, but you know, I want to thank you because um, what you're saying about letting this help guide how you actually write the story, I, I realized while writing this, what I need to focus on, <laughs> what the framework really needs to be in the book that I'm trying to write now. <clears throat> and these are all working titles and things, so none of this is necessarily what it's going to be, but... In Monk, Miller captures the essence of motherhood and letting go while giving voice to everyone but the main character. First Father Peter, who mentors an novitiate monk and has his own agenda, leading him to guard the fragility of the situation by keeping the mother distant. Then the postal worker, who notices, <clears throat> notices the correspondence and uh, develops her own theory. Hmm. A vision emerges of a character the reader knows is obscured by the perspectives of others. At once mystery and heartbreaking narrative, Monk addresses themes of the rigidity of religion, the loneliness of being human, the stories we create, and ultimately the courage needed to let go. Woohoo! <laughs> so thank perfect. you. I just think I think I know what I need to write. <laughs> That's awesome. That That's really helpful. Really helpful. Great thank you so work. Much. Thanks. Awesome. That's what I'm talking about. Great. Okay. Who's next? Randy? Okay. Mine's, make sure I'm off mute. Okay. Um, mine's a short story. So my blurb is short. In this short story by Randy, the love and obsession of an obit writer brings about questions of who writes an obit and what does an obit mean to the living and the deceased. Find out who writes the obit writer's obituary. Nice. Very nice. Good job, Randy. I want to read that. I like that your writer, your author name is Randy, too. <laughs> okay, Amber. All right. Uh, in this personal narrative, Amber J. Kaiser interrogates her failures as a ballet dancer, a scientist, a parent, an activist, and a writer. When she views these events through the lens of place, she reveals the common thread that unites both tragedy and accomplishment, the small cabin in the middle of nowhere built by her grandmother in the 1930s. An incisive look at the myths we tell ourselves, everything and nothing is a story about our place in the universe. Are we irrelevant or essential? 
With the lessons she learned from her grandmother, Kaiser begins to reframe her own narrative not as one of failure, but as a story of resilience in the context of a culture that values outcome more than process. Through intimate descriptions of an iron hand pump and repairs to a dock ravaged by ice, Kaiser reveals universal themes of ambition and resilience in the remote landscape of the Canadian wilderness. Woohoo! Way to go! That was beautiful. (laughs) So good. So good. Oh my God. Thanks. Love it. Love it. Okay. Trudy, are you next? I, I realize we're over time. So if you, if you need to go, feel free to, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm up for hanging on as long as you guys want. So go for it, Trudy. In her memoir, Stumbling Towards Grace, 40, um, uh, describes, ner- describes her search to understand family dynamics that have kept her trapped for years in a spiral of secrets and silence around them and the toll it takes on her sense of self with a language that is lyrical and filled with a long longing for something that is not shared nor understood by her siblings or parents, her need to uh, accentuate how different she is. confirm and accentuate how different she is. The journey to self-acceptance is a long and troubled one, raising more questions than answers. It is only when she begins to own her own story that the shackles of the past dissolve and she begins to embrace her own journey. Oh my God! Now I've got to write the memoir. (laughs) Yeah, now you're on the hook. We have a lot of overachievers here. Go yeah, Trudy. All, all you all are on the hook. That that uh, I had just a feeling in my gut as you were reading. Um, awesome. Okay, who's next? Thank you. Who's next? Anybody else want to share? You could share in the chat. I don't know if there's anybody, anyone in the Andrew's okay. got his hand up. Oh, Andrew, go for it. Okay, make sure I'm off mute here. <clears throat> okay, uh, real quick. In this fantasy series, Andrew J. Smiley explores the nature of mankind's search for connection to the divine through the eyes and ears of Yoriel Familia, a group of ordinary high school students who are wrapped up in the perpetual war between the light and the darkness. As angels, warriors working for the en- enigmatic Seraphim organization, the five students put on the skin of superhumans with the aid of Virgil, an eternal being who watches the world and supports the team as they battle the denizens of Eden, a realm once known as a paradise, but has fallen and become the throne of the darkness. Woven through the epic struggle of good versus evil are the lives of the members of Uriel Familiar, their thoughts, dreams, passions, and despair that drive them to question the world around them, both the real world they live in and the hidden side that has become an engine of destruction in their reality. At the end of it all, on which side will the angels stand and which world will be their home? Oh my gosh! <laughs> really nice, really. Nice. Did you guys hear just the interplay of plot and story there? Which you know is another talk we could have sometime. Awesome. Okay, anybody else? Very nice. Any hands up that I haven't seen? All right. Okay. Well, um, thank you all. You guys are awesome. This is so fun. And it sounds like there was some connection, um, different kinds of connection. And uh, that makes me happy. I'm really, really, really happy to, to be with you tonight. So thank you. So awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Yay. Thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Ellen. I, 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 I like what you just said about plot and story. I think that that a lot of times these blurbs that we write are all plot and mm-hmm. the story is the aboutness. And I think that that's what people are really looking for mm-hmm. um, when you read a book jacket or when you're submitting to an agent, you know, they want to know what the, what the aboutness is, what that emotional journey is that's going on, not just um, they did this, then they did this, then they did that. So Super helpful. I got a lot, um, a lot of stuff started here that I'm going to work on. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. 
uh, next month, uh, Sarah Sear is going to talk to us. Um, I'm going to send out a an email uh, re-announcing that winter December reading thing. Um, so please sign up if you haven't read before. Or if you have read before, please sign up. We'll we'll shoot for as uh, Mary said, ten to fifteen people, and we'll likely be doing it um, virtually. We may, uh, I worked with Paige this past week and we may be able to have some people at the library who could sit and read, but in that um, we really wouldn't be able to have much in the way of audience. So it'll be a virtual thing if you're, if you're watching and so we'll let you know when that is. Um, that's it. Great to see you all. Thanks for coming and um, Thank you. Have, have a great one. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And, Bye. And, and thanks, Paige, for hosting us. A great night, everyone. Hope to see you again at the library very soon.